Dr. Frank Shoshem, Senior Director of Algenol Biofuels, when he developed a 38-member R&D department with focus on second-generation algal biofuels ethanol industry as an assistant professor at Florida International University from 2001 to 2007, Frank developed and launched a new degree program in marine biology, achieving enrollment of 100 declared majors within two years of program initiation. Notable achievements include pioneering research in flow cytometry for aquatic research and linking new type of algal bloom in the Baltic Sea to historic changes in watershed nutrient composition. Frank also holds an MBA with concentration in international business from Florida Atlantic University and is recognized for his expertise in strategic planning and establishing and managing startup business lines ranging from renewable energy, green technology to public print publishing. Okay, let's get you on. You got control. You can either do it by that or you can do that. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, Jay mentioned uh, the marine biology program that we started at FIU, um, which we were very proud of to achieve that enrollment in, in such a small time. And one of the questions is, what do you do with hundred marine biology majors every year, right? So we're trying to create a new job market for those poor people who took that choice. But we're also trying to contribute, I don't know if it's an infinite source of energy, but definitely a renewable and environmentally sustainable form of energy. And, and one of the things that uh, people talk about today is algal biofuels. And there are a couple of uh, companies and all um, in their own way, doing different forms of biofuels. I want to introduce you to one um, algal biofuel company that is home here in South Florida and that started here in South Florida, and that's Algenol Biofuels. So what's the overall goal that Algenol Biofuels wants to do? There are two sides of it. One is the production of sustainable energy and the other is to make an impact on sustainable industry and climate protection. So our value proposition is to start with a sustainable carbon capture and reuse. And I think this picture is very um, exemplary. It reminds me of the area I was born at and I come in from, lots of steel and coal industry in my hometown. And yes, back then we couldn't leave the, the cloth out on the line for too long because then they get gray again. So what we propose is taking part of this pollution, taking part of this carbon dioxide capture is, and using algae, so to speak, as a biocatalyst to combine it with sunshine, which usually we have ample of in Florida, and salt water, and that's an important part as well, not just water, but salt water, and using an algal bio platform to produce ethanol, biomass, which then again can be trans, uh, transformed into other forms of biofuel, like biodiesel, jet fuel, or to produce chemicals with those algal biocatalysts, like propylene, isoprene, butanol, and there's a whole slew of products that these algae can produce for um, what we call a green chemistry or bioplastics or whatever keyword you might hear. Now the major difference between Algenol's process and that of all the other algal companies is our main goal is not to have this grow algae, harvest, and convert concept, which you can then use the algal biomass to either um, get the biodiesel or ferment it to ethanol. That is comparable to the corn ethanol, where you also have a grow, harvest, and then transform. One of the key technologies at Algenol is that our algae produce the ethanol dire <clears throat> directly, and we can harvest that without the need to transform um, the biomass or the biology. 
So to start out with a brief overview of what Algenol is, Algenol is headquartered in Fort Myers on the West Coast. We have, um, as you see on the picture there, and I'll show you uh, another picture of the whole campus there, we have research labs and aquaculture operations in Fort Myers. We also have a very substantial lab with about 60, 65 people in Berlin, Germany. We have a total of 165 employees, including 66 with advanced degrees in some sort of biologic field or engineering. Algernal is a private equity funded company. Obviously the founders and owners put quite some money into it. We have about $160 million equity capital. We received 25 million as a grant from the Federal Department of Energy to develop and build an integrated biorefinery. And you will see some pictures of those. And we received a $10 million economic uh, development grant from Lee County, um, which we used to help building out this research facility that we have at the other coast. Incidentally, for people who are more home in this part, Algernal actually started its first aquaculture operation here in Palm Beach County in, in Loxahatchee, it's a little west of here. Um, and then in 2010, 2011, we moved and consolidated all U.S. research in Fort Myers. Uh, we have there a 90,000 square foot research facility um, with state-of-the-art labs. We have a four acres, what we call process development unit. This is an aquaculture operation where we test our aquaculture infrastructure and processes. And we have a further 36 acres for demonstrating an integrated biorefinery that we are in the process of building. So this is an overview of our campus. Um, a little while ago, um, if you fly over it every week, it looks a little bit different as we build out the lower part of this area. So you see on the top part our buildings, the engineering building, biology building, uh, our administrative headquarters. You see here on the right, this is the labs and the processing pavilion of the integrated biorefinery. There you find biologists doing algal work on larger scale, but also the complete downstream processing of ethanol harvest and concentration. On the left lower part, you see this process development unit. You see some bioreactors here on the ground. And then what you don't see is the 36 acres that go like on the lower right where we are building our integrated biorefinery. The best way actually to look at this is book a flight and fly into Fort Myers Airport. Uh, the planes go right over us. It's, uh, this is actually where this picture was made. Some of our colleagues taking a commercial flight. So why are we doing this? We have technology that we can provide a productivity of um, a little more than 8,000 gallons of ethanol per acre per year. And then with eventually some spent biomass, we can confer, uh, convert that biomass into um, biodiesel, biojet, other fuels. That gives us another about 1,100 gallons per acre per year. So altogether, more than 9,000 gallons of sustainable fuel produced per acre per year. Um, we are using sunshine, which usually is free. We're using CO2 from industrial sources, and one ton of CO2 captured pr uh, produced about 144 gallons of biofuel. And we're using salt water, um, and depending on where you want to build your production facility, you can put this close to the ocean, then you can use ocean water, you can use brackish sources, or you can use like what we do in Fort Myers, a uh, saline aquifer, and pump the water from there. What we don't use is arable agricultural land, like corn ethanol does. So we're not competing with food production. We're not using fresh water, which will become a major commodity of concern 
over the next century. And we're not using major inputs of fossil fuels to produce our ethanol. When you compare the yields that you get, corn ethanol now makes about 420, we call it GPAY, this is gallon per ethanol, a gallon ethanol per year and acre, or acre and year. Um, some varieties of sugar cane can get you up to 800 gallons per acre per year. Cellulosic, maybe around 500. So we are at about 9,000 gallons of sustainable biofuel per acre per year. That is the difference, and we're not using farmland. So how do we do this? We're using these tiny little microscopic bugs called algae, and for the scientists, they are not really algae, they're actually cyanobacteria. And we overexpress enzyme or genes for enzymes of fermentative pathways that take part of the photosynthesis that these algae perform, like all plants, and instead of leading into internal reserves of sugar or growth of these algae, we divert part of this photosynthesis into a fermentative pathway that directly creates ethanol. Now, algae really can't do anything much with ethanol. So what do they do with it? They excrete it into the culture medium, into the water, and from there, um, we just uh, harvest it or isolate it and concentrate it. Now, this is a little more complicated than it looks here. Um, the first is you have to find good algae to um, work your process with. We have isolated about 2,300 different strains of cyanobacteria from almost all over the world. We have had a huge screening program to find the best organisms for our uh, photobioreactor systems. We have now strains that are very robust, that have a very high productivity, and have a very high productivity of ethanol or diversion of photosynthesis to ethanol. So we're targeting about this 8,000 or a little more gallons per ethanol per acre per year. Where are we? Um, in 2012, we had peak productions of 9,300 9, gallons per acre per year. If you were to see, uh, analyze it, there are seasonal fluctuations like in any agriculture. In winter, it's colder, less light. You get a little bit more than in summer. So if you analyze that, this would be what we could have achieved with further strain development, which is ongoing like in all biotechnology industries. Now, um, the last year, I must say, we had up to 10,400 gallons of ethanol per acre per year equivalents. So we're improving our strains. We do have a production strain that we know can deliver those 8,000, 9,000 gallons per ethanol per year. In this process, 85% of the captured carbon dioxide is converted into biofuel. The algae are grown in seawater in our proprietary photobioreactors, which you see here in the middle. In very simple terms, very big Ziploc bags. Of course, a little more complicated than a Ziploc bag, otherwise we wouldn't need years to develop them. But that's what it basically is. We feed the CO2, um, we have the algae. We have production cycles of four to six weeks, after which the algae are separated from the water, we harvest the ethanol from the water, and we convert the algae biomass into other biofuels. Now, to harvest the, uh, the ethanol from that water, we have some enabling technology, very energy efficient um, separation methods to get the relatively low concentration of ethanol out of that seawater and then use uh, more commercial technologies to enrich it to fuel grade ethanol. So our production cycle, again, we have the algae in the bioreactor. Um, they basically grow there and, and produce the ethanol for um, four to six weeks. And then we have two streams of downstream processing. We have the fuel grade ethanol um, 
the cultures themselves contain somewhere between half to one and a half percent ethanol. So that's still far from fuel grade. But we have a proprietary technology that's called um, vapor compression steam stripping that with very low energy input enriches the ethanol to five to 10 percent in fresh water. And from there on, you can use new membrane technology or classic distillation to enrich it to fuel grade. The membrane technologies we're going to use, uh, work with are, again, much more energy efficient than the classical distillation. The biomass itself goes through a hydrothermal liquefaction process. So under high temperature pressure, you liquefy the biomass and you convert it into biodiesel and biojet and other fuels that is, is kind of somewhat similar to what other um, companies do. So our really key enabling technology to get the ethanol out is this VCSS or vapor compression steam stripping combined with membrane technology. See these prototypes of systems here in our IBR. Um, with this technology, it enables us to get this ethanol out of the algal cultures and not using more energy than the energy content of the ethanol we produce. And that's an important point. Because if you look at some other technologies that are out there, where people also are on the similar track and want to do similar products, it sometimes is not clear that, yes, you can do this and you can create this product, but if you use more energy to make this product, what's the use of it? So this is a central consideration in our process. And so this, again, the hydrothermal liquefaction is what, similar to what other companies do. The biomass, uh, about 70% of that biomass is converted into additional fuel. And down there, these actually are little bottles of actual bio, on the left, biodiesel, or, or this is kind of a raw biodiesel and gasoline that was produced from our algae. So you could pour this in your tank, you don't get that far, but it works. Um, we are on the path to commercialization. Um, the company started in 2007, so some years have passed. Some major R&D work has been completed. We are going to commercialize. Um, we started early last year to build blocks of 40 bioreactors. Then we built blocks of 400 bioreactors and operated them uh, as, as units. Then towards the second half of last year, we'll build blocks of 4,000 bioreactors and operated them. So we are scaling up and making sure that the processes that de we develop in this process development unit are scalable to commercial si uh, sizes. What is a commercial size? We will build out that field that we have in Fort Myers. We will start with filling two acres by this July 1st and we'll operate this. And we will continue building this out. As I said, we have the 36 acres there. By ne mid of next year, by June of 2015, we will build a 100-acre facility in the state of Florida. This one eventually, throughout 2016, we will build out to a 1,200 acres facility with a commercial source of CO2 that feeds those algae. And this kind of artist rendering then shows you what you're dealing with. Large lands with thousands and thousands, if not millions, of bioreactors making ethanol at about eight, nine, ten thousand gallons of sustainable biofuel per acre per year, not using arable farmland, not using fresh water. So this, this again is, is our commercialization path here. So we're right now already in 2014. Um, when we have built this facility in Fort Myers, we should get about 16,000 gallons of fuels 
per year out of this facility. We will validate our processes, our operations. We build the production facilities that we need to sustain the supply and logistics for building commercial facilities. Um, this, this slide still says 400 acres. Um, we're starting with a 100 acre by June of next year, building this to a 1,200 acre um, facility. These numbers always change a little bit because when these slides were made, we, we have not finalized the final agreements with lands and CO2 sources, but we're very progressed in this, um, uh, in this process. So this should give us eventually about 18 million gallons of biofuel per year out of this kind of facility. And then, of course, we're open to expand. There will be facilities that will be owned and operated by Algenol, and there will be other facilities worldwide that will be licensed out, um, will be launched with the help of Algenol, but will be um, run and operated by other companies. So we hope that we are on the path of providing ethanol, or as a next step, once we're in this process, we're also going to pick up our green chemistry, what we call the green chemistry program, and producing other chemicals that you can use for plastics production, like propylene, you can, you know, uh, uh, propylene bags. Even ethanol, you, you can not just burn it in your car, you can also use it to make polyethylene. So if you're a big plastic manufacturer, making polyethylene bags produce a lot of CO2. While well, you capture that CO2, use that CO2 to make new ethanol, convert that ethanol to make no, more polyethylene. You can put on your bags. We're using our pollution to make new bags. And this is our value proposition. And this is happening right here in South Florida um, over the next two years. Thank you very much. A dollar twenty. A dollar twenty. How does that compare to, say, corn-based ethanol production, with or without subsidies? <laughs> <laughs> the question about what you pay on your E85 pump, and yes, I have a suburban with a flex fuel too, because otherwise you can't drive a suburban. Um, it depends on how much the government gives. The ethanol we produce today would not be sustainable if you want to sell it for the, I think they sell it for about 310, 315 now at the pump. You couldn't do that without subsidies. Um, the whole ethanol market is subsidized. We want to be at 120 without subsidies, because we believe that even if it's a good technology, it will only establish itself, you know, if, if people see, well, this is what I pay and, and not pay twice as much through my taxes. It's an economic process to establish sustainable technology. Uh, really exciting, some of it, the whole technology, but that really seems to be not just American-based, but Florida-based. So what are the Germans doing? <laughs> the Germans, it's, it's the history of the company. The German lab in Berlin does a lot of the molecular biology. We do have molecular biology in Fort Myers, too. Uh, but the, the company, as it grew initially, uh, the founders ventured out and said, okay, we need some people to do the genetic engineering. Where do we find the best groups? And they ventured through America, Japan, elsewhere, and found this group in Berlin, which was a small startup company out of the Humboldt University there. And said, okay, you will do the, the molecular engineering. And then there, they met this guy, this professor from FIU, and say, hey, you want to build the aquaculture farm? And they say, yeah, well, I'll do that. Um, so we built this here in Loxahatchee. Um, we had an engineering lab and a molecular biology lab in Baltimore, and this was all later consolidated. But the molecular, it, it was easier to get people from Baltimore to move to Fort Myers than from Berlin. Mm -hmm. They kind of have families and all that stuff. 
How does a, a acre of corn compare to an acre of um, algae relating to ethanol production? Well, I had this somewhere here. So I think corn now is at 420, some people might say a little more, say 450 gallons of ethanol per acre per year. And as I said, sugar cane around um, 800 in Brazil. Um, we are at eight, nine, ten thousand. So it's it's a factor of 10, 20 times more. But again, not on farmlands. We're looking for mar marginal lands, uh, desert lands. If you have a desert close to an ocean, perfect. Means nobody wants to go there. Land is cheap. You probably have a lot of sun because it's a desert, and you have a lot of seawater. Well, uh, a kind of a follow-up question to that, I'm, I'm over here, oh. uh, is just looking at the, in, the environmental impact of the two delivery systems. I mean, do you guys do an analysis on that, looking at what the impact is of like ethanol production on uh, pollution, those kinds of things impact? Well, we do have, I mean, the, the state doesn't let people do whatever they want to. There is regulation in the state. There's also federal regulations around this. Um, the state is very concerned when they he hear cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. And they think of the St. Lucie River, uh, the St. John's River. Then they think about big algal blooms, toxic cyanobacteria. So our strains are all non-toxic. We do environmental studies to show that our organisms do not persist in, in, in natural waters and do not form blooms in natural waters, so we don't have ecological problems should there be some spill of algae. Um, the ethanol itself, since it's all a closed system, does not really get into the environment un unless you have like a major like industrial type um, accident where your, your tankage breaks or something. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's fertilizer use, pesticide use, herbicides use. We all don't have that. Uh, you know, also because it's a closed system, our algae are pretty segregated. So they don't get out, and typically, hopefully, nothing else gets in. So that's all very segregated, and, and yes. And this all plays also into the whole life cycle analysis if you look at things like carbon footprints. Um, because, yeah, corn ethanol, what people always forget is you got to actually calculate in not only the fertilizer use, but how much carbon do you use to transport the fertilizer to the farm? Well, how much carbon do you use to make the fertilizer? Which means how much carbon do you use to mine the rocks and the sediments that you make the fertilizer from? And it goes back and back. And if you add this all up, your carbon footprint is not that much better. And we have published a life cycle analysis, and I don't want to spoil the party, but even if you compare it to an electric car, it really depends on where you get your electricity. You know, if you have uh, very clean, like the newest generation gas power plants, that's fine. Of course, if you have coal in your mix, the carbon footprint of our ethanol and driving a car with that ethanol is actually much better than an electric car. So we also have to look at where do we get electricity from, what is the fuel base underlying that electricity. One more question. I have a, a question. On the business side, uh, as you know, a couple of companies in the region have tried this in the past few years. And when they were trying to move from the 5, 10 acre to the 100 acre, something did not work. What have you learn from this to make sure that that doesn't happen to you? Our systems are modular. So um, our, our base module now is about one and a quarter acres. That's what we consider our base module. And basically what you do is, is if you figure out how to operate this and you want to have a larger facility, you just add more of those modules and you operate them in the same way. So in this, in this beautiful um, facility here, 
what's not shown here is it's not 1,200 acres just of this field of bioreactors. That is subdivided in blocks and modules. And there is, for certain processes, some degree of decentralization. The ethyl, there's not one ha uh, ethanol harvest station or downstream processing for the whole uh, system. You know, so th we have this, this, one, uh, this, this uh, one and a quarter modules which are maybe put into uh, five, 10 acre blocks and then many of those uh, are, I don't know what you then call it, a, a subunit or whatever. And you size your processing to these subdivisions. And once you have that, you just build more of those. And this is what we do in Fort Myers with this pilot plant that the Department of Energy has funded. And this is where we worked out the processes and the sizing of the technology. Now, the next exercise is literally then, okay, instead of building one, like in Fort Myers, now we're building 10, and we're building 100, and, and so on. You add other logistic problems to it, how do you deliver CO2, how you transport your product, and so, but this is more like classic logistical problems. That's not necessarily, necessarily the, the fuel production technology. And I'm not sure, because there are a lot of things that I see other algal companies do, or also universities do, and especially with universities, there is a lot of things you can do, and it works. But economically, it might not be worthwhile doing it, or it might not even be recommendable to do that. Some of the culture systems give you very high productivity, and then you ask, well, how much does that cost? Well, now calculate me a, even a 100-acre facility. Nobody in the world has that much money to buy that. You know, that's why we're using Ziploc bags. Well, I hope your company succeeds. So do we.